All right, if I asked you to name a Thai dish, like first thing you think of on the spot, go. What just popped into your head? All right, now how about something Chinese? What about Indian? Now, what about something Burmese? Anything? Have you ever thought about how strange it is that the place literally in the middle of those other three iconic food cultures is a total blank spot on the map? Now, I'm a chef, and I've lived in a bordering country for more than 12 years, and it still never really occurred to me how insane it was that I don't know anything about Burmese food. At least until I stumbled into the wrong street cart and had one of the most incredible meals of my life. It turns out, somehow totally under the radar, there's an entire Burmese subculture here in Thailand. Thousands upon thousands of immigrants and refugees building their own community where some of the best food in Asia is in the back alleys of almost every district and neighborhood, just right there hiding in plain sight. So today we're on a mission to figure out what is Burmese food? Where can we find it? And why did it completely disappear from the culinary map? The place where I first had my reality turned upside down is here, at this humble street cart in Bangkok's Little India. This is a place we come a lot for, I mean, Indian food. It's a Punjabi neighborhood and maybe the best place in the city for rich North Indian curries and, of course, our favorite masala tea. But off in the corner, there was always a crowd around this counter, so one day when there were two empty seats, we sat down. It's not often I try something that's nothing like anything I've ever tasted before. But here, it happened twice in the same meal. There was this, la petok, a salad of crispy split peas, fried garlic, sesame, and fermented tea leaves. This was just a shocking amount of flavor, sour and salty and packed with textural contrasts. And in any other situation, it would have been the highlight of my week to discover it if it weren't for the next dish, which was this. Sticky flat noodles covered in a rich gravy of chickpea and turmeric, packed with seasoning and flavor and just a touch of jaggery for sweetness. This is the most comforting of comfort foods and honestly a pantheon dish up there with almost anything else I've ever eaten here in Southeast Asia. It made no sense to me how I'd never seen, tried, or imagined these dishes before. And that's just one single street cart. How much more must be out there, hiding in plain sight? And how is it possible that all this Burmese food is so completely unknown? Now, I don't want this to be a story about war. I mean, those are basically the only stories anyone ever sees about Myanmar. I want to talk about food and dishes like this, but to understand how this unique culture formed and why you know all about Pad Thai but maybe nothing about Mohinga, we have to at least acknowledge the elephant in the room. For the sake of this story, I'm going to skip about 4,000 years of history and pick things up in the 1940s. The British have been kicked out after a generation of colonial destruction and the Japanese have fled after crushing the British and killing a couple hundred thousand Burmese civilians as collateral damage. The new country is on a knife's edge. I mean, before the English arrived and drew their own borders by gunpoint, this was still a place where various ethnic groups had their own kingdoms and where throughout the centuries, power had waxed and waned between Buddhist and Hindu and Muslim leaders, Chinese and Mongol, Indian, Siamese, and the ethnic Mon. Anyway, in the first few years after the end of colonial rule, Burma did pretty well. In fact, for a time in the 1950s, it was probably the most promising post-colonial country in all of Southeast Asia. But again, these were borders drawn by the British, and some ethnic groups felt marginalized in the new country and pushed for independence. And that gained momentum in the democratic system. So in 1962, in the name of nationalism, the military seized power in a coup, dissolved the elected government, and stifled any notion of regional independence. The country fell into sectarian violence, widespread oppression, and massive corruption. 
And since I'm really not trying to make this a story about war, we'll just simplify it to say that that never stopped. The chaos touched off in 1962 has only continued to spiral into war and poverty. All of that is to say that while over the last 50 years the rest of the world discovered the paradise of Southeast Asia and dishes like pho and laksa and pad thai started to spread, Burmese food was locked behind closed borders and all of its secrets stayed hidden. But hidden is a relative term. Between 2 and 3 million refugees and immigrants from Myanmar are in Thailand right now. And in Bangkok, the city where I live, as many as 1 out of every 15 people here is a migrant from Myanmar. About 45 minutes west of downtown in an area called Ekachai, well that's where most of those migrants start their new lives on this side of the border. It's a district mostly unknown and a place even most local Thais have never heard of before. But this, specifically the Bangbon Market, is the center of central Thailand's Burmese refugee population. And that is where we went to start our journey. As a guide and translator, I brought along a friend who happens to be a well-known Burmese chef from Yangon, who's also coming to this market for the first time. How do I say thank you in Burmese? Jezuba. 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 Okay, what do we have? Right, so I actually prepared a plate for you. I, I kind of pointed out which one to have. So this is um, beef stew with um, roselle and bamboo shoot um, stir fry. So this is um, one of my favorite dishes as well, and it's uniquely for me, so you have to try it. And this is mohenga. This is my favorite, all-time favorite breakfast dish. Same. Same, yes, okay, same. Perfect. So you have to try this. This is, um, yeah, mohenga. This is like your go-to dish. This is um, the unofficial national dish of Myanmar. You know, Thailand, I love Thai food, obviously. So do I. I. The flavor profile tends to lean towards a balance of, let's say, sour and sweet. Mm. This leans towards a balance of sour and salty. Mm. I would say the sweetness is definitely toned down um, compared to what you'd expect from like a Thai curry. And that's, as you said, the absence of coconut milk. If there's, I don't know if there's there's sugar, but there's not much. If there is, probably not at all. Yeah. No, um, um, we don't use um, sugar in our cooking. I mean, if anything at all, it would be MSG. So our dishes are our foods more savory and salty, a bit spicy maybe in certain regions and um, sour, but certainly not sugar, not sweet. Absolutely mind blowing how good that is. Can you actually help me to order a second plate just like this? Just like this? With them, do you want uh, beef and the. Uh, yeah, yeah because I'm gonna just eat this. Go for it. This is me. And this is like. It's that good. It's that good. I mean. <laughs> yeah, I could eat this. It's just so different from Thai food, right? Like. Savory, salty, sour. Along with snacks and prepared food here at the Bangbon Market, Gugu pointed out to us some other things that made her feel like she'd just stepped back into Yangon. There's this, a traditional Myanmar version of a shampoo made with the kinpun fruit, the bark of the gruya tree, and lime, used widely in the country for more than 2,000 years. And then there's this, Kunya in Myanmar, betel nut in the west, ubiquitous in the country, betel leaves brushed with slaked lime and mixed with areca nuts, anise seed, and cardamom. This is the stuff that's chewed which gives a mild caffeine pop and a mouthful of red spit.
four years ago, Pew, or Gugu as she's known by everyone, owned a PR agency in Yangon. Her focus was promoting the country's best restaurants and F&B venues, and she was at the top of her industry in Myanmar. But then came another wave of war and crisis, and in the middle of civil collapse, most restaurants aren't looking for public relations. So Gugu left for Thailand, where she realized that maybe her clients didn't need her help, but her country did. Encouraged by fellow refugees and local chefs in Bangkok, Gugu embarked on a mission to bring Burmese food to the outside world. She began to host pop-ups and cooking classes to raise awareness of her country's cuisine here in Bangkok. And then, she pushed farther abroad. Singapore and Hong Kong, Sweden, Italy, and multiple events in France. It became an all-consuming mission for Gugu to show the world that there was more to her country than violence and strife. There was also a cuisine that by all rights deserves its own spot among the world's true culinary giants. Tell me a little bit before we stop talking and, and, and start eating about food diplomacy, what you do, right? Because what, what I'm bringing up and the reason why I talk about the public perception of Myanmar is you are actively trying to change that. This is what your mission is. So tell me about your idea of spreading, I guess, diplomacy for Myanmar through food. <laughs> well, I mean, I feel that we're forgotten in the world. We, it seems like we're invisible almost. Um, I've had um, incidents where if I tell them where I'm from, whether I say I'm from Burma or Myanmar, they never know where, where this country is. And we're not even a small country. And then only when I tell them, oh, it's actually right next to Thailand and then between, I mean, bordering, China and Laos and Bangladesh, then they vaguely know where it is, but um, we're pretty much invisible and it's sad. And also, another reason is because our cuisine is actually very palatable and diverse. And I really wish that people know a bit more because um, um, everyone knows about Thai food, everyone knows about Vietnamese food, Laos, Laosian food, just not Burmese food. It's really good. It's really, mm -hmm. it's really, really good. When I started cooking, I mean, um, it was mainly in Europe, and um, I've had people uh, very, very emotional because it felt it took them back to Myanmar, and um, I mean, that's when I know I'm doing, I'm, I'm, I'm on the right path. And um, I've had in Italy, for example, in Trento, it was a room full of people, and um, I cooked and I served, and then I came in, and then there was a, they, everyone stood up and then just clapped, and they were very, very emotional. Ooh. I was involved, I was very, very emotional because you know they were, they said, I mean, with the um, current political situation, they couldn't go back, and then it felt like they were still part of Myanmar and it took them right back to the time so that's when I knew I'm doing an okay thing. <laughs> In 2016, after decades of struggle and turmoil, Myanmar citizens finally forced open elections for the first time since before the coup. A non-military government was voted into power and the country began to liberalize. A second round of elections were held in 2020, in which the party representing the old dictatorship won only 33 seats out of 476. This was followed by celebration and hope, and then, in the middle of the night on February 1st, 2021, another coup. Elected officials were thrown in jail, tens of thousands of activists were executed. What should have been a high point on Myanmar's road to freedom instead saw the country plunge to a new low. 
There is no silver lining in a situation with so much death and devastation, but in a morbid and twisted way, the brutality of the present crisis might be what finally brings Burmese food to the outside world. Because now it's not just political refugees fleeing, it's successful business owners pulling up stakes and starting again outside. Like the owners of this place, which just opened in Bangkok a few weeks ago. Gugu brought us here before she bid us farewell, and it happens to be right downtown near my house. It's on Sukhumvit 21 in an area called Asok. This place is brand new, but for the owners, it's just another start for a business that's beloved at home. Before the coup, this family owned a chain of noodle shops and tea houses throughout Shan State in northeast Myanmar. And while I wish this place never had to open here, I mean, okay, maybe there is a tiny silver lining, at least for the new customers, like me, who'd never tried Shan noodles before, and are now exposed to one of the world's great everyday meals. So, yes, what's your sure. goal? Tell me 10 years from now. Mm-hmm. What, what do you want to be, not just you personally doing, but what would you like to see in terms of the global recognition of your food? I want everyone to know what the petto is. I want everyone to know what moenga is and um, what shan khao sui or shan noodles is because those are my top three favorite <laughs> dishes so yes in a way for selfish reasons as well every time i travel somewhere i don't want to have to cook for myself i want to just walk into a restaurant and order a lepetto or a, or a shan noodles or mohinga so that that would be that would be my dream Just a little bit further from downtown, there's a neighborhood called Pratunam, an old business district now famous for textile factories and electronics markets, and a place where slowly perhaps the world's first little Myanmar is starting to take shape. Like Gugu giving up her PR firm to learn how to cook, here the Burmese food is being spread by people like the managers of this restaurant, who back home were a banker and a zoologist. This is called the Mandalay Food House, and it's as much a community center as a restaurant. Every Every day, the restaurant serves hundreds of meals to Burmese of all backgrounds, because somehow, in a country geographically larger than France or Spain, with coastal lowlands and jungle-covered mountains, with Hindus and Muslims and Buddhists, and with so much history of war and tension, the food is pretty much the great equalizer. From north to south, a distance farther than New York to Cuba, Nearly everyone in Myanmar starts their day with a bowl of mohinga and probably has a grandmother making her own pickled tea leaves for La Petok. And maybe one day it'll be easier for us to find that stuff too. Last year, with the business taking off, the Mandalay Food House expanded to a second location, 
then a third all along this same alley. It's this neighborhood, Pratu Nam, where Burmese living and working in Bangkok have started to build something of a home base. And not just with necessity shops and a market, but with trendy cafes just like along the streets of Yangon. A sense of normalcy, something that must be nice for all the people who are here but would really like to be home. Most of the business in this area is meant to service the Burmese population. But there's one restaurant that's turned their attention outward. For the last few years, Kalyana has earned a reputation among immigrants here as Bangkok's best Burmese restaurant. It was a pretty tiny place, just a few tables, but with high-quality food and a well-respected chef. But a few months back, the owner had an inspiration. The place next door closed, and they decided to try to remodel and rebrand and to see if they might become the first Burmese restaurant ever, at least in Thailand, to scale up and reach a wider audience. The new Kalyana, the one intended to appeal to the rest of Bangkok, opened at the beginning of the winter. From the upstairs bar to the decorative touches to the incredible menu with regional sets and original Burmese-inspired dishes, they got all the details right and it was packed at 3.30 in the afternoon on a weekday, packed with Thai and Chinese customers, and by 5, we had to be gone because their dinner reservations were fully booked. I guess the secret to getting people to like this forgotten cuisine is getting them to try it. It seems as simple as that. It's a terrible fluke of timing that after 4,000 years of history and centuries as one of the world's great culinary melting pots, just as exotic cuisine started to pinball around the world, a time that should have been a showcase for Burmese traditions, the country all but fell off the map. But whether it's through the work of someone like Gugu pushing Burmese cuisine to a worldwide audience one person at a time, or maybe some of Myanmar's best chefs who find themselves abroad and serving their traditional recipes to a new audience, or forward-thinking entrepreneurs risking their business to reach a wider following. Sooner or later, this story will be told. And in the meantime, if you're ever in a busy and affluent area and you see a crowd of workers around a humble street cart off in the corner somewhere, don't think twice. Just grab that first open stool. Because if you're lucky, it might just open up an entire world you didn't even know existed. Subscribe to the channel for more from OTR. Find bonus content on the Patreon, and please don't forget to check out our website and Instagram linked below. And follow Gugu on her social media too, we'll have the link in the description box, because there's a good chance she's coming to somewhere near you. Oh, my heart's racing already. It's so much more intense than... It's a mild caffeine, right? It's a stimulant, so it's like concentrated coffee.